In this chemistry tutorial, we're going to look at isotopes and relative atomic mass. The first aim is describe the term relative atomic mass, then explain what an isotope is, and finally calculate the relative atomic mass for an element. Now you may know this very iconic piece of architecture in this picture. This is the Empire State Building, and it's one of the tallest buildings and biggest buildings in the world, nearly 400 metres tall. And like all buildings and all things in this universe, it's made of atoms. Now you may remember from the tutorial on atomic structure that atoms are 99.9% .9 space. So if you could suck all the space out of the Empire State Building, how big would it be? Well, amazingly, the Empire State Building would be reduced to something the size of a grain of sand. In other words, if you are only left with the protons, neutrons and electrons crammed together without any space between them, it'd be the size of a grain of sand. So next time someone the size of the Incredible Hulk challenges you to a fight, remember they're not really as big as they look. So to understand the term relative atomic mass, we're going to first look at the carbon atom. Carbon is an element commonly found in coal, so if we could look at one atom in this coal, this is what it would look like. Now just to recap, if you remember in the nucleus of an atom, you have two particles, neutrons and protons. Protons have a positive charge. And in the shell surrounding an atom, you have electrons, which have a negative charge. Now you don't need to know charge to understand relative atomic mass, but I always think it's good to recap, because students commonly forget the charges. Now electrons are so light, we don't factor them in when trying to work out the mass of an atom or an element. Instead, the mass comes purely from the nucleus. See, protons and neutrons have a relative mass of 1. That means they have the same mass. So to work out the mass of an atom, you simply count the number of protons and neutrons, p plus n. So the relative mass of this atom is 6 neutrons plus 6 protons, so it has a mass of 12. So carbon has a relative atomic mass of 12. But why do we say relative atomic mass? Why don't we just say atomic mass? Well, relative takes into account when you compare a mass to something else. Now, the periodic table you have in school and you have in your exams is a nice, easy one to understand. In fact, all the masses, apart from chlorine, have whole numbers. But in reality, sophisticated periodic tables actually have many decimal points. The mass isn't a nice, rounded, whole number, except for carbon. The reason for this is quite complex. Basically, uh, when the nucleus forms, some of the matter in the nucleus is lost as energy, giving you not a nice round even number. But carbon kind of works out exactly around 12. The key point here is when we say relative atomic mass, we're talking about the mass of other atoms relative to the mass of carbon. So relative atomic mass can be abbreviated to AR. You might get that in the exam instead of the words relative atomic mass, so make sure you remember it. To help you remember, just think of it like this. Think that the A is the A here and the R is the R here. Okay, so back to this idea of relative mass. So carbon has a mass of 12, and if you look in the periodic table, hydrogen, the simplest element, has a relative atomic mass of 1. What this means is relative to carbon, hydrogen is 12 times smaller, or the other way around, carbon is 12 times greater in size than hydrogen. Remember that mass is literally how much matter is crammed into the nucleus. So magnesium, for example, has a mass of 24. That means it's twice as great in terms of mass than carbon. So I hope you understand the words relative atomic mass. So if you have to define it in an exam, you just say the mass of an element's atom when compared to the mass of carbon. So that is how you describe the term relative atomic mass. So now let's try and understand the term isotope. The word isotope literally translates to same place. Iso means same, tope means place, from the Greek word for place. So we're literally talking about elements that occupy the same place in the periodic table. But that probably doesn't help you very much. So let's think about it in terms of cards. So in a deck of cards, you have four suits, or if you like, four families. You have hearts, clubs, spades, and diamonds. Now, each family or each suit contains a number of values that belong to that suit. For example, you have ace of hearts, king of hearts, two of hearts, and so on and so on but they still belong to the same set. You can think of the 118 elements in the periodic table as different suits of cards, where each suit or each element contains a number of different types of atoms or different values of atoms. For example, there isn't just one type of carbon atom. There are many. You get carbon-10, carbon-12, carbon-14. So what does this mean exactly? Well, they are carbon atoms because they all have an atomic number of six. In other words, that means they all have six protons in their nucleus. You can count them here. 
That's what the atomic number tells you. The atomic number defines the type of element the atom belongs to. So if you have an atomic number of six, you will always be a member of the carbon atom family. It also tells you that they'll have six electrons in the shells, which always balance the number of protons. So the overall charge of an atom is always zero because the positives cancel out the negatives or balance with the negatives. But you don't really need to think about electrons when trying to describe or define isotopes. You just need to think about protons and neutrons. Now, it's the neutrons you'll see that are different. You only have four neutrons here. You only have six here, and you have eight here. Now, the neutrons don't affect what the element is. So you could have 15 or 2,000 neutrons here, but as long as you have six protons, it will still be a carbon atom. So chemically, these are all very similar atoms. They will behave in the same way, but you can see their mass is increasing. So if you count the number of particles here, they'll equal 10. Whereas here, 6 neutrons and 6 protons, 12. Here, 6 protons and 8 neutrons adds up to 14. That's why this is called carbon-14, this is called carbon-12, and this is called carbon-10. So the textbook definition of an isotope would be, isotopes are atoms, in brackets, of a particular element, with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, or you could say different atomic masses. These are the two most important statements you need to include in your answer when addressing how to explain what an isotope is. And I hope this diagram makes it very clear. Same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. And you can apply this logic to any element in the periodic table. I've just chosen carbon. So that is how you explain what an isotope is. So now let's look at the most challenging part of this tutorial. How we calculate relative atomic mass, calculating AR. Now, as I said before, if you look at your periodic table, you'll see the mass of each element in your table is a nice whole round number. That's true, except for with chlorine. Chlorine has a mass of 35.5. Now, if you think about it, this is quite confusing because it has 17 protons in its nucleus, so that's why it has an atomic number of 17. All these numbers here, by the way, are the atomic number, not the mass. But I told you that if you count the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, you'll get the relative atomic mass. Now, if protons have a mass of 1, and neutrons also have a mass of 1, how can you end up with a mass which is 0.5? That just doesn't make sense. Well, it does actually make sense. You just have to readjust your definition of what relative atomic mass is and how it's calculated. Here's a nice, simple way of thinking about it. Imagine you have a class and you're trying to work out the average height in that class. In other words, the sort of middle value height. Now, you could get the class to line up in order of height and you can see there's some very tall people on this end and some shorter people on this end. Now, if you only had two people in that class and one was very tall and one was very small, then you'd expect the height to be in the middle of those two. But a class doesn't contain just two people. You have many people of different varying heights. But you can see here that the number of shorter people is greater than the number of taller people. So that will shift the average towards the shorter end of the spectrum. In other words, to work out an average, you don't just take into account the different types of values, in other words, short or tall, but you also take into account how often those values occur. So they're far more shorter people than taller people. This is exactly the principle you use when trying to work out the relative atomic mass for an element. So the relative atomic mass takes two factors into account. Firstly, the mass of each isotope for an element. For example, you might have carbon-10 and carbon-12 and carbon-14, so there are three different masses there. But secondly, their relative abundance. This gives you an idea of how much there is of each isotope compared to the total amount of element in the world. So here we're looking at the element chlorine, and we can see we have two isotopes with different masses. One isotope has a mass of 35, and one has a mass of 37. So if you counted the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of this isotope, it'll add up to 35, and this one would add up to 37 but you can see their relative abundance is different. What this tells you is that for every three atoms of chlorine-35 there are in the world, there'll be one atom of chlorine-37. So how do you work out the relative atomic mass using this data? Well, the first thing you do is you multiply the relative mass by the relative abundance for each isotope. In other words, 35 times three, and 37 times one as two separate calculations. So 35 times three, 37 times one. And that will get you two values, 105 here and 37 here. Next, you add the figures together. So you add 105 to 37. 
and that gives you a value of 142. And then you divide by the total number of atoms present in the sample, or divide by the sum of the relative abundance, same kind of thing. So the two abundance values we have are 3 and 1, so you do 3 plus 1, which is 4. So effectively, you're dividing 142 by 4, and that will give you a value of 35.5. And that is why chlorine has a relative atomic mass of 35.5. So if we go back to our sliding scale example, you expect the value between 35 and 37 to be in the middle, so it should be 36. But when you take into account the abundance, you see there's more 35 than 37. So that skews this average towards 35. And that's why the answer is 35.5 and not 36. So now let's look at an exam style question, because this is quite commonly occurring in the science exams. And I've noticed students find this generally quite difficult. But once you understand it, it's really very easy. Questions in this topic generally adopt this sort of format. So it will say something like, a sample of boron is made of 20% boron 10 atoms, the rest of boron 11 atoms show that the relative atomic mass of boron is 10.8. Now whenever you're asked to show that a value is this much in a question, don't let it phase you. You can pretty much ignore it. It's just saying carry out the calculation and hopefully your answer should be in line with this answer. It should either be spot on or very close. So in this question, we have the element, which is boron. We know that we have two types of isotopes here with two different relative masses, boron 10 and boron 11. So we can write the two isotope masses here. But what's the relative abundance? Well, here we're given percentages. So we know that 20% are boron 10 and the rest are boron 11. So that means 80% are boron 11. But whenever you're given a problem where you have percentages in this sort of question format, think or imagine a sort of box in your head and inside that box there are 100 particles or 100 atoms of boron. 20 of those atoms will be boron 10 and 80 of those 100 atoms will be boron 11. So write the relative abundance accordingly. So 20 for 10 and 80 for boron 11. So for every 20 boron 10 atoms present, there will also be 80 boron 11 atoms present. So now you can perform the calculation. Why not try pausing it and giving it a go first? So remember, the first step is multiplying the relative mass of each isotope by their relative abundance. So 10 times 20 and 11 times 80. That gives you two values, 200 here and 880 here. Next, you just add them together, and that gives you a value of 1080. Then step three, you add the relative abundances together, so 20 plus 80, which obviously gives you a value of 100, and then you simply divide the top figure by the bottom figure. So 1080 divided by 100 gives boron a relative atomic mass of 10.8. This shows that the relative atomic mass of boron is 10.8. If I were you, I'd look at past papers right now and try and give as many of these a go as possible. They often carry quite a few marks, even up to six marks, which can raise your grade by one. And that's how we calculate the relative atomic mass for an element.